wildlife adds personality, it adds purpose and definite eye candy to any garden. When I was a student, I studied at my landscape architecture and Chris Baines was one of the lecturers and he made a huge impression on me. He's a wildlife campaigner, he's written many books, he's done television series and he did the first wildlife garden at Chelsea in 1985. So really, having had that heavily instilled in me, how important wildlife is, I've actually tried to make sure that you get some areas that wildlife really appreciate. And if I'm looking at how to improve wildlife in a garden, I think possibly the number one item is water. On a sunny day, when I go into the greenhouse and I water my plants, I notice the bees all follow me in. And that's often because they want to drink. And they are actually drinking from the little droplets of water all the way around. And it's not just bees, it's obviously all insects and things. They all need water. So if you can have even a small source of water, maybe a bowl or something like that, or if you've got the space, a lovely large big pool, then that is a great resource. It will pull in the insects, the birds, the actual fish and newts and frogs that actually live in the water. It has a massive, massive pool. Sometimes you'll see deer coming to drink from it. I've seen woodpecker drinking from ours, ducks. And not only does water really good for wildlife, but I think it's quite mesmerizing because when you have it in your garden, and you watch who's coming to look at the water, it adds a completely different dimension. So I always try and include water into my garden. And I think it's also quite soothing. When we're building gardens at Chelsea, on the last week, everybody fills up their water features. And somehow, if you've got a hot, dusty site and everyone fills up their water features, it's just so soothing. And you notice that many more birds and insects come in as well. Lots of us are concerned about the declining bee populations and I was fascinated when I was working at Highgrove they had a wonderful stone statue with a water feature and they used to cover the stone in the winter because it wasn't a frost durable stone and it started to erode but they noticed that in the summertime there was moss on the statue and because bees love drinking from a shallow water source they would be all over the moss drinking from it. So they decided to stop covering it up in the winter because bees do come out in the winter too and they left the moss on and they let the statue just slowly deteriorate. And when I'm here I've noticed sometimes that the water butt has bits, have dead bees in because they've been thirsty, they've come out and they need a drink they go into my water butt and they can't get out. So it is important to put a bit of floating wood or something on top of water butts and things so they can get out. Also, if you've got a pool with hard surfaces and with no marginal plants for insects and bees to come in and out, it's useful to put some sort of ramp or something so they can. Prince Charles at Highgrove, he has these lovely willow ramps that he puts on the edge of the pool and they see the wildlife going up and down the ramps. So it means they can have access to the water and they don't get too thirsty. And just bear that in mind, if you've got any sitting water that's quite deep, just make sure it has great access for wildlife. When you have the edge effect, you're going to get more biodiversity and by the edge effect I mean the edge between two different types of habitat so here I've got my longer slightly longer grass squares which will become quite long and I've got my mown paths between so on the edge between the short and the long you will get more diversity of species because you've got different types of animal and insects that's going to use those spaces and it's not just between long and short grass it's the edge of the woodland and the grassland the other side. It's the water edge and the marshy area beside it. It's between a shrubby layer and a grassy layer. So just bear that in mind. The more you can increase your range of different areas, the more edge effects you have, then you are definitely going to pull in more wildlife. Now I can hear the wind around me here. And I've got the shelter belt, which I planted when I came. And shelter 
is really good for wildlife because if you've got a very sterile area that's just blown to bits by wind, then the wildlife isn't going to be happy. And so apart from having the trees, then if you can develop an understory in your shelter belt, that gives more shelter, more spaces for birds to nest in and for insects, then obviously that's to the benefit. Now you might say, well, we haven't all got acres to plant masses and masses of trees in. But now you've got the microforest, which is a fairly new concept. And they're also called Mayawaki forests because they're developed by a Japanese botanist. And it means basically that you can get a microforest in a space as small as five square meters. So maybe that's just two and a half meters by two and a half meters approximately. And the whole ethos of these microforests is that you plant the trees very densely together. So you might get three or four trees per square meter. So they really are at very tight centers. And you try and, and use quite a few different species so you get variation. And the reason that you plant them so close together is because then they all go upwards. They're competing with each other for the light and they grow much, much faster. I've noticed in, in my own bit of woodland where it started to regenerate, they are really like 100 mil apart in places. So you get this very dense woodland and the Mayawaki microforests are actually mimicking this. So you can get a large forest within about 20 to 30 years, whereas if you have the more normal way of establishing forests at much wider centres, it might take you 100 years or whatever to get that effect. So it really is boosting the time frame. It's got a wide variety of trees in it and it encourages lots of diversity. Moss is, is wonderful because it's a great carbon sink. It really does trap the carbon within it. And people, when they plant trees and the garden gets shadier, you tend to find you have much more moss coming anyway. Or some people actually establish a moss lawn. And that needn't be too difficult because there are so many hundreds and thousands of different species of moss that there are some mosses suited to almost any situation in a garden. And there's a moss specialist that lives up the road and he was telling me one of the better ways that you can do to establish moss lawn is to clean the weeds away and then just transplant pieces of moss from around your garden in similar situations and maybe transplant pieces like that sort of diameter, really quite small, and just pop them in and then water them. And you might need to just protect them with netting to stop the birds taking it for nesting and things like that. But it is a nice area to have. It looks lovely. When I visited J Japan, when I was working there, they have a lot of moss lawns. Now, if, you, if you're in a very dry garden in the height of summer, you will need to water it and things to keep it going. But if you don't water it, it will no doubt come back when it gets wetter. But maybe consider a bit of moss lawn. Obviously, plants are a key to wildlife and you want to have a nice range, a diverse range that you like. If you look at a buddleia bush in summer, I mean, that is just the biggest butterfly puller you can ever imagine because it's got lots of individual flowers on the lovely big inflorescences and they've got nice deep centers where the butterflies can go in and get the nectar from them. So you might see a butterfly bush in full flower just covered with butterflies. And it's amazing and it's obviously doing a lot of good. Um, but also, if you've got um, a square patch of land, maybe a few square metres, and you want to get some insect pulling plants in there fairly fast, then I think you can do well by choosing pictorial meadows, wonderful flower seed mixtures. These were developed by Professor James Hitchmo and Professor Nigel Dunnett, and they produced a lot of the wildflower areas at the Olympic Park a few years ago. And what they've done with these flowers is they've chosen flowers that will germinate really easily in a wide range of conditions. And if you sow them at the end of March, they will then be in flower maybe six weeks later. And they will keep on with a succession of flowers through the season, right the way up until the frosts. Now, they're not necessarily native, but some of them are but the mixes are graduated, so you get the flowering continually 
successionally flowering all through the summer months. And they're very inexpensive, they're very easy, and they're very, very floriferous. So I'm going to use some up the drive this year because we've had a fibre cable put down there and it's bald. So I'm going to sow a lovely strip of wildflowers down there. I'm going to sow a couple of raised beds with them in my garden, in the vegetable garden, because I think they'll be nice to pick at during the summer as well. And they'll pull in the insects and maybe dive divert the pests from my brassicas and things like that. I might put a mix in a couple of big pots. I could sow them under a bare bit in a hedge. So anywhere you can put in some flowers and some greenery, which the insects will appreciate, you will enjoy them and it will certainly help the wildlife. Lots of people love a bit of grass in their gardens and you know, you can sunbathe on them, do handstands on them, play croquet or football on them. They're brilliant. Um, but if you actually think of the grass as a huge wildlife attractant, then maybe we should manage it just slightly differently. If you have a very close mown lawn, it won't attract a lot of species. But if you can just raise the mower blade so they're maybe just an inch and a half, so it cut and collects it an inch and a half, then you're going to get a lot more moss and butterflies in there as well. And I've noticed since we've used the robotic mowers, which just cut the grass every day, and they just leave a tiny bit of the cut grass on the lawn, which then rots down, I've noticed there's a massive increase in birds that peck around in there. And I think it's just because it's a lovely rotting mass, so you're getting lots of biodiversity in that little lair. But then, if you think of a wildflower meadow, then you can go one stage further. So maybe you have a bit of moan, and then you let some grow much longer. And that obviously, like I've got these little squares here amongst my orchard, and I see the bats flying over here in the evening, obviously looking for the insects. I see birds in here pulling worms. There's a, quite a diverse range. We've got some orchids in here, primroses, um, all sorts of things are coming in. And it's dynamic. You know, every year I see different plants, which is exciting to garden. So then when you come to the end of July, say when it's dying down, then it does look a bit tatty. And so if you find that tatty look is not to your liking because you're a tidy minded gardener, then what you can do is just sort of shear the edges a bit so it doesn't look so floppy and doesn't all flop over on the mown bit. And sometimes I do little willow fences just with a piece of woven willow arched over along. So it sort of forms a division between the longer and the shorter and it just looks more defined so a wee bit neater if that appeals. But if you don't want it either short or very long you can do the in-between look and that is you can just mow it maybe once a month and cut and collect it when you mow it and you mow it really high. Um, so it will be mowing it the highest setting your mower will do maybe something like 100 and 150 mil high. And that looks really nice because it looks more kempt if you don't like the more unkempt look of the wild meadow. Um, and yet it does attract obviously more wildlife. And then when you have the mown pass through the slightly longer grass, you really define the spaces and you can do serpentine paths, you can do paths on a grid, you can do informal paths, whatever you like. Of course, if you want to banish grass from your lawn altogether, but you still want to have a space that you can lie on and play on, then maybe consider a grass-free lawn. We have done a whole video on grass-free lawns, and these are amazing because they will flower throughout the whole year. Now, they are a little bit more awkward to establish. You need to clean the area of all vegetation first, and you need to plant the plants from plants you've grown in a seed tray or plug plants and you plant a mix of 23 or 25 different species and so that it actually is a tapestry of lovely low growing plants like alpine strawberries, like thymes, like self-heal. You might have some primroses like I've got here, a uh, creeping buttercup or whatever and so you are really pulling in the insects and pulling in the wildlife and it's a joy to look at. And you can actually walk on these lawns, these grass-free lawns. You wouldn't play football on them, but you can actually walk on them. They will take some amount of human foot tread. So that's another option. So when you're 
laying out your garden initially, if you're at that stage and you're deciding what to have, make sure you get many different tiers of vegetation within it. Make sure you get lots of edge effects. Make sure you have lots of water, maybe running water um, or still water, um, possibly a micro forest. It just adds a hugely different dimension. It really brings a garden to life. And I think it's just fascinating to live with. And I would hate to live in a garden that was all hard surfaces that didn't attract any wildlife and was totally manicured. For me, it really wouldn't be a living space and living in a living space I think is just fantastic. <laughs>